Welcome to another video, the second into Enemy Within Adventure Book 2, Death on the Rake. If you are not up to speed, I suggest you go cuts up with the rest of the series, where our players are traversing the lands of the old world, facing all kinds of dangerous and mysterious encounters, leading to potential destruction of whole cities and releasing unimaginable terrors upon the land. Who wanna miss that? If now you are up to speed, let us continue with our journey. Our players have already reached the village of Unterbaum by now, and they are heading towards Devil's Bowl, the location the meteor has crashed and created a crater 200 years ago. Druids have built a stone circle to contain the unholy and mutating power of the stone. Still, it blighted the lands, and the players can clearly see it. Leaving their canoes, since their barge was too big to traverse this small river, they will proceed on foot. Four days away from Underbaum, they will find themselves at the crater's edge. Now it's filled with water and surrounded by manures. Resting here, they will encounter the ghastly figure of a woman floating towards them, asking for their help. She is pleading for her bones to be buried since he is trapped in this godforsaken place for a long, long time. The ghost is Brunhild Grayton, a scout Dagmar von Wittgenstein hired for his expedition. After she found what she was sent for, Dagmar killed her along with all of her companions. She is restless since then, haunting this cursed place. If helped, she will share some light into the dark story of Dagmar's and how the meteor changed him and she will lead them to the cave where her bones and the bones of her companions lay, waiting to put to rest. A place where is going to be the first encounter for your players with the infamous Skaven. This almost mythical creature that nobody admits they exist anymore. They are also pulled here by the meteor, seeking warp stone. Fun little encounter, the Skaven are talkative, trying to find what the adventurers know. They are trying to earn some time to get in the perfect position to attack. They are six in total, not a negligible amount. And if captured, the Skaven will start to torture Korobreth for information, giving the players enough room to prepare an escape or a counterattack for that matter. In worst case scenario, the spirit of Brunhild will always be there to help them out if she feels the party will help her with finding her bones. At the entrance, the skeletons of the rest of the expedition party lie, attacking the players and pleading to be destroyed. In their rotten backpacks, the players can find gold, healing potions and the final key to Dagmar's library. It's identical to the one the zombies had on the signaling tower. The map they will find there, which is identical with the one they already have, will help them connect the dots if they have not already. Since players are players and might miss the important clue of the key, Brunhild can be used as a link to give them the information they are missing, telling them that the pack is Dagmar's and might be useful to them. Once they finish with the burning and cleansing of Brynhild's bones, she will rest in peace, thanking them for their service. To her, her friends and the world, if they manage to destroy this unholy item. Also, in the cave the players can find tracks of Atelka and Ernst. They have probably have left when they realize the stone is gone before the players have arrived and their campfire can be found. Having complete their missing puzzle, your players should start to head back to Underbaum, but not without always having eyes on them. Skaven will always track them from now on. The feeling of stalking will always be there, and that will lead us into chapter 5 of the book. By now, the following should be known to your players. They have the key to the library of the observatory. They know Dagmar retrieved a large piece of warp stone. He killed all his scouts and explorers while they found it. And the Red Crown has already arrived and left from the Barren Hills before them. So the logical thing for the adventurers will be to head back to Camberbad and straight into the signaling tower. Their travel should be uneventful for a change and the town will be a familiar place for them by now. Of course, a couple of things will though take place while in the city. They can encounter the Red Crowners, Atelka and Ernest can be seen leaving the city in hurry once they have seen the players, giving a sense of urgency to your players that they will have to act fast. Still. Cutting up with them will be a hard task, since they have already horses and probably your players will not. Another group that will not forget your players is the Purple Hand. They will spot Caster once more and start tracking him to his inn. 
and a letter will be handed to him. The lock of hair that they once took from Castor is in there, along with this last warning. Asking who gave the letter, the barkeep will show a hooded figure with four thags on the table who will instantly start casting a spell when he sees Castor looking at him. The thugs will protect the caster as best as they can. If completed, the hands of Castor will be purple for nine days. Harmless spell, but uh, not in the presence of a witch hunter or anyone else seeking ruinous power lovers. If the caster is stopped or captured, he just knows that he was ordered to deliver the letter and pass this empathetic purple hand warning. He only knows of his own cell, who all have fled the city by now. So hopefully your players will now arrive at the signaling tower to find it at the same unfinished status if the Gao was not killed the first time they arrived. The dwarfs will be dead for at least a week. The site is totally abandoned. Now, if they have killed the Gao, it has progressed considerably. The dwarves will be delighted to see them again and even have more workers being there and helping to finish up. This is the perfect place to have the meeting with the Red Crowners. There are a couple of ways this can take place. Either the Red Crowners have already taken the tower, they have hired thugs and they have captured the dwarves. Etelka and Ernest along with some more thugs are trying to pry open the library. So the players can go head on, free the dwarves, receive the spell barrage from the two or try to create some kind of an ambush. A second way this could go is for you players to have missed the Red Crowners. It is kind of more complicated, since they will have to track them down, dwarves can provide some information, but still it's hard scenario. If there is no reason from your backstories to support it, there is no reason to make things harder on yourself. And finally, the third option and most challenging for the players is to be jumped from the cult lists when they are searching the tower at the worst possible time. Wrapping up whatever choice was taken on the signaling tower, the adventurers will head south towards the last part of the adventure, Castle Wittenstein. Passing once more through Camberbard will enable another encounter with the Purple Hand. The head of the Purple Hand in town had enough. A group of three cult lists will attack, one of them a wizard along with half a dozen of thags. That is a seriously challenging fight. They aim to take Castor as a prisoner, while the rest must be killed. And that will conclude chapter 5, and the beginning of chapter 6 will start with the players entering the village of Wittendorf. Your players will feel like they are participating on a dark, scary horror movie. And rightfully so, this place is coming out straight of a nightmare. Located near a forest that is infested with mutants and beastmen, the villagers are suffering their poverty in isolation. Nobody hardly ever comes here anymore. It looks like a ghost town filled with beggars and dogs fighting for a bone. The players will arrive through the wharf and they will start exploring this godforsaken place, which is imperative for their success. There are two key locations they should investigate, the Physician's House and the Templar of Sigmar. But in between they are swarmed by beggars. Talking to the beggars will yield nothing of importance. They are mostly an annoyance to the players, constantly asking for food or money. They will be seen drinking from a dirty bottle. Once respectable citizens, now they've lost everything to Jean Roussel's rotgut liquor or from the effect of the warp storm that took place a couple of years ago. They are infested with mutations that have withered their bodies or filled them with deformities some have chosen to cut off. They are filled with lies and pus-dropping sores. Kurtz Kurtzman, a servant of the village physician Zan Rousseau, is selling them the Rotgat liquor. Unknown to everyone but Lerdy Margit, the Rotgat contains powdered warp stone, making them the way they are. Even the physician believes that this liquor is a rare medicinal chemical. Some of the beggars are so desperate that they have turned to cannibalism to make it. They take corpses from the graveyard in order to survive. They live at the temple of Sigmar and move around the village through secret underground passways. The following events will take place when the adventurers arrive. The first day, the pale lady. As players reach the top of the wharf, they will see a beautiful young woman in dark blue, mounted on a horseback and surrounded by six guards. They bear the crest of the Wittenstein family on their shields. The woman is Lady Margaret, and she is abducting another villager, a beggar. 
lies on the ground bleeding. He is being beaten by the guards and picked up while the lady looks coldly at your players in the eyes while they're heading back at their castle. If they intervene, they will have to deal with the six guards and she will help as well with her spells and eventually they will flee to the castle if she realizes that they're losing. The dog and the bone man. They will witness a man fighting a dog for a bone. If they will not intervene, the beggar will be slain by the dog. And a few moments later, more dogs and beggars will come to drive off the half-starved dog and carry the body to the boathouse, where they will cook it and eat it. If the beggar is saved, he will hug the players, infesting them with lies, while picking up the dead dog to a nearby building, accompanied by a bunch of beggars, to cook and eat it. The Watcher the players will feel, while they are in the village, that they are always watched by a well-dressed man. He is the physician, Jean. He will introduce himself if approached. He is very busy alleviating the suffering of these poor souls, and he will invite them on his home for dinner the next day. Now, the following day, there is a mother in need. A young woman with a baby in a blanket will approach the players. She will plead them to save her baby who is dying. The physician can do nothing, only making her baby even worse. And to make matter worse, her husband has been taken to the castle by the lady. It's the man that they witnessed the previous day being taken by the guards. Looking to the blanket will shook the players to their course. Rather than an infant, the bundle holds a large but docile spider. Whether that was her child or not is not clear. Still, this is a scene that will haunt your players if played right. The impounding. Eventually, the second day, a force of 20 guards led by Kratz, the surgeon of the guards, ride down the wharf. Gone straight to the vessel of your players. This boat is impounded because you didn't call at the castle to pay the toll. Now it's too late. Well, a fine will be decided all in good time, but for the time being, your players will witness their boat being taken through the castle water gate and tied to the wharf there. On day three, there's three pints and three straws. On the third day, the party will reach the Shooting Star Inn, while three guards will enter while the players are there and order drinks that they drink with a straw, refusing to remove their helms. They will ask the patrons about the attacks that are happening towards the guards. While the patrons refuse to say anything, they will pick the eldest of them and will start beating him up. If not stop, they will take the poor man outside and put a noose around his neck. For the last time, they're going to ask, where are the outlaws? The patrons will not answer. And if your players will not stop them, the man is going to be hanged. Turning at the rest of the people, the guards will threaten everyone that they're going to come back tomorrow to do the same thing unless they share some information about the outlaws. If the players interfere, it will lead to the guard to run away and gain some of the support of the patrons, informing them that they should be careful now since Kratz and a dozen of guards will be here soon for them, making them outlaws as well. So this is the point, or at any other point that they have stunned against the guards, that Hilda will offer to take them to the outlaws' camp to protect them from the upcoming wrath of the guards. But now that the events are out of the way, let's take a closer look at the actual village, the Shooting Star Inn, a good starting point to gather some information. Most people will avoid strangers, but will respond to direct questions. They won't talk about the castle, but they can guide the party to the Temple of Sigmar or the physician's house. Herbert is the innkeeper for 20 years. Losing his family a while back has sent him at the utmost catatonic state. He knows much of what took place in the village, but will not serve them easily. He most definitely don't know about the ghouls that they have broken into his cellar. The physician appears well-mannered, selfless, benefactor to the afflicted peasants. But the truth is different. To find out about it, the players should find themselves into his cellar. He will try to arrange a dinner with a party to meet Lady Margaret, but with drug disses, 
The players will see the beggars coming and going at his house, exiting with blue substance bottles. He's giving them the rot gut juice. Having the chance to go over his house, correspondence with Lady Margaret can be found that will shed some light into the situation on the village. Even more will be found if they head to his cellar, where the warpstone dust will be found, along with a dead mutated body that is being hacked off at the table, revealing the taste for human flesh the dog has acquired. Now, if dinner takes place, they will see a carriage arriving from the castle with a lady and four guards. Chit chat will take place, and obviously she is ignoring the situation that takes place on the village and blames it on the bad times that they are all experiencing everywhere. The foot of the players is laced with nightshade. Either they eat it or not, the guards will be called in to overpower the players eventually or to protect the lady, a temple. Abandoned when the priest was mysteriously killed six months ago, the temple has been taken over by the cannibals. In here, the players will find out about the barony of Wittenstein, making it an important location to investigate. The story of the temple can be found on some inscriptions and also a book that tells the legend of Sigmar, giving the players that read it a blessing. In the desk here, all of the Wittendorf records are births, deaths, marriages. The players can see how prosperous this place was a hundred years ago and how it has transformed. They will find out more information about Dagmar and how his crate that brought back was blamed for the disastrous harvest the following years. The storm that mutated most of the people is detailed as well. The wind of chains are seen on the backbone of this village. These entries stop six months ago. Going on the crypts, the player can find Barakul, Hope of the Mountains, a powerful dwarven magical sword that slices through non-magical armor that batter. A very helpful item for them. Just a mile out of the village, a small group of beastmen will make their existence known to the players while on the forest heading to the outlaws. Near the camp, the area changes. It is protected by Rhea, a trap-filled location. The players will meet about 20 outlaws. They are led by an ex-priestess of Rhea, Sigrid. She can show the players to some caves that might lead onto the castle. When the players leave the camp, they will encounter Kratz with six guards and a beastman with enhanced smell. Thankfully, they are downwind and they have a chance to ambush them, but not for long. One way or another, your players will find themselves at this turning point, where the only logical solution will be to storm the castle and be done with it. The castle Wittenstein is divided into three sectors, the outer bailey that houses the guards and some of the mutant beggars, the inner bailey home to the family of Wittenstein, no guards are here but Lady Magritte has her own ways of defending the place, and beneath the inner bailey lies the dungeons. The castle has in total 25 guards and roughly about 18 beggars that probably they won't fight. Now the attack that will take place on the castle has three ways to happen. Either from the main gate, or the water gate, or the secret entrance from beneath the castle. Obviously the two gates are well guarded and the chances of your players making it alive if they go full on confrontation will be low. Still, we are game masters and we have seen a lot. Show your players the scenes, describe as best as you can and let them decide what they do. The best choice, of course, will be to enter via the secret entrance onto the outer bailey and then to lead the outlaws in an assault on the guards there. Solid plans of reconnaissance might earn more people to help the attack against the monsters that rule the town. Sigrid will be willing to participate on attacks based on sound plans. She will divide the outlaw group into two. One will take and hold the main gate and the other will seize the outer gatehouse. They will provide a secure line of retreat for themselves and the adventurers if needed. But your players are the one that they are in charge. Let them think about this attack. This is an epic invasion against the tyranny of torture and abuse. They have seen enough of it. They will most definitely come up with some great and some not so great ideas. Let them enjoy this moment. Preparing for something like that will be the most fun a group can have. Allow them to go crazy. And when they actually choose the plan that they are ready to go forth, make sure that you are fair. This can take so many different outcomes that I won't even begin talking about it. I bet your players will have a field trip 
with his setup. What is not to love? Evil tyrannical monsters that have destroyed the lives of a whole village? Check. An amazing castle that looks impregnable, but they have located a backdoor into it? Check. A group of outlaws that can help out by organizing them? Check. Read out ideas that they're giving in the books in page 85 and 86, but I would suggest you take a more cinematic approach to it. Have your players as the main focus of your camera, of course. But when one of the other groups are faced with something threatening or devastating, turn the camera to them. Allow your players to see from a small window or, or a balcony of the castle, it doesn't matter. The epic scale of a dozen of people's fighting in the yard when something goes wrong, and then show them that the outlaws need help and put them to the test. Will they abandon their plan to save their backlines? Those are the best encounters a game master could wish for. Just bear in mind that Sigrid and the outlaws will only help with the guard towers, and they will not risk her people with the inner bailey. Your players are on their own down there. Now, a small remark. In the book, there are different approaches for the outlaws. There might be a group of mutants that they are hiding and waiting for the full prey to come on their own. They might be working for the Skaven, or simply be ruthless criminals that found safe haven at this abandoned from God village. All those are great options to have open. If your players are too cocky or too overpowered and there is zero real threat when they are storming the castle, the outlaws can be used as a mechanism to pressure your players at the worst possible situations. When they are parading the tunnels of the castle being foolish or over cocky, that is the best time for their backs to be filled with outlaw arrows. Moments to teach your players the hard way that the preparation and caution is of the utmost importance and are not easy to be found. And the adventure designers have given us one that works perfectly. And here is where I'm going to put a small end to the descent into darkness. The castle needs a video on its own and it's going to be a final part of the second book of the enemy within, The Death on the Rake. Thanks so much for being here. This was the RPG Loremaster and welcome to my mutated table.